Hello, is this working? Okay, uh, seems my little thing seems to say that uh, you should hear me. Uh, thanks for joining for the big return of the cafe released uh, after, I believe, uh, three years of absence. And yeah, as I was explaining to my guest, uh, several uh, nice people with cool project came to me to be featured on interviews. So I thought, yeah, three, uh, three, I need to come back for that. Uh, without further ado, please meet Tim. Tim, uh, could you introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is um, Tim Roberts. I am the founder of Critical Kit Limited in the UK. And um, yeah, I create tabletop role-playing games. So how long have you been doing that? Wow. So I've, I've really only been creating role-playing games for about three years. I wrote my first game about three years ago, but I have been playing role-playing games since the 80s. So um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been in on the scene for a long time, but I've only really done this professionally for about three years. And you're even a, an awarded designer, I believe? I am, yeah. My first, <laughs> quite surprisingly, my first game, um, my first game won uh, UKG's um, Role Playing Game of the Year, which was, um, I think, it, I think it was the first solo game to win it as well. So, oh wow, um, it was up against, it was up against some big games, and it was, um, yeah, I think it was a bit unexpected for us, which was, um, it was a nice surprise. Congratulations. This show actually started uh, in uh, the dark times of the, the pandemic. So I used to have the ice-breaking question of asking, what does your routine look like, your day-to-day -day life? It used to be more like, oh, what does your a typical day look for you in the, in the lockdown situation? But now that we're out of that, what's, what's the new, a quite old new normal for you? Uh? Um, well, at, at the moment, at this moment in time, it's very unique for me because I guess the first thing I do on a morning is I check the Kickstarter. Um, but that's that's definitely a very sorry the backer kit. I have to keep I keep calling it Kickstarter because we've done so many Kickstarters. Um, so that's the first thing I kind of do just to see where we are and maybe answer any comments people have people have had. Um, but my day generally, I, I so we also sell a lot of accessories. That's where our business really started about five years ago selling accessories like dice mainly um so one of the things we'll kind of do on, on, a, on a morning my wife and i sarah who's who's a partner in the business we'll just discuss some business things and then generally she will um take over from there with the general running of the business and, and just allow me to write so i will i will try and write as much as i can i do get distracted um quite easily <laughs> but i do try to also um get through as much writing as i can in a day um, so it's a mixture of running the business and um probably planning events, conventions, and, um, yeah, writing. And, uh, yeah, this morning you checked and uh, you, you're getting close to those 50K uh, stretch goals, I think, on uh, your project, which I don't think we even have named yet. Um, yeah, we, um, yeah, so for, yeah, for Punk is Dead, um, we are now at about, I think we just tipped 46K in the last hour or so. Um, it's been absolutely, I mean, it's been, it's been fabulous. I, I think, I'm I'm fortunate to have built up a community with Be Like a Crow, my first game. Uh, but yeah, it's we still seem to be getting a lot of new people. I think we're now bringing on board some people who are either Merc Borg fans or quite a few people that have never played a role playing game, but they're just interested in the musical aspects of it. So it seems to have captured, um, you know, the imagination of a few people, and that's you know that's that's a good thing. It's a really good thing. It's a bit, I guess, uh, the, coming back to the origins almost, you know, Merck Burke uh, was punk and punk yeah. to some extent came from the UK. Now it's coming back to the UK yeah. to, to punk itself. Yeah, it is, well, yeah, it is a very UK centric game is, um, is punk is dead. It's, you know, punk did originate in the UK. I was just a little bit too young, ju just a little bit too young to be involved in the original punk scene. But uh, definitely in my sort of formative music years, you know, a lot of punk bands were involved. So we did listen to some older music. And I think bands like The Clash were definitely a big influence on me, um, you know, from a, sort of, I'd say, politically and also from musical taste and creativity as well. And um, yeah, I did, I did, I did create the game as, 
as being UK centric. I wanted it to be a bit different to Merc Bog insofar as Merc Bog is in a fantasy world. I wanted to bring this into a a fantastical version of the UK. And I guess there's nothing to stop people from playing it in their own countries as well, which who knows, that might be a future future endeavor. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm going to put some, some uh, images of the game. So what, what is the elevator pitch actually for Pumpkins Dead beyond being Merc Bog uh, compatible? <laughs> so the, the rather whimsical elevator pitch is it's like Scooby-Doo with mosh pits and music. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I suppose it's a little bit more hardcore than Scooby-Doo. The, the, the general concept behind the game is, is a post-apocalyptic United Kingdom. Um, everything that's gone wrong, could go wrong, has gone wrong. And the situation is that, um, well, the world's quite dire, pretty much like Merc Borg. It is on the, it is on the verge of ending. And you are basically members of a punk band who are trying to go around the country in a, in a clapped out old van, um, write songs, play music to people, sp spread a message of hope. But also you do get to solve mysteries and kill bad guys. So there is the, there is the sort of um, um, the quest type element that you'd expect in all role playing games, in all role playing games. But it's, it is also a songwriting role playing game, which, um, is, that, that's intriguing. I think it's that's quite in, unique. I'm that's intriguing. I'm very intrigued by that bike song writing. What what does actually that means in in terms of of, of play? Oh, you're muted. Apologies. Yes, I am. I don't know why I'm muted. Then. Um. Yeah. So. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So as as, well as you play the game. The general idea is, so w with a lot of the games that I write, I try to bring another aspect of creativity into them. So like Be Like a Crow is creative writing with rules. Um, another one of my games, D666, is dungeon building with rules. Um, so this game is not different in that aspect. It, 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 it functions like a regular role-playing game, but the big difference is that um, if you're going to play it rules as written, you're supposed to put a big sheet of paper in the middle of the table and one that's accessible for everybody to scribble on and write on and put graffiti on and make notes on. But ultimately, as you go through the game, players can suggest lines for a song. So each session, um, you should really be also thinking about writing a song. Um, so you can, you, you can do this yourself. You can do this just using your own creativity. But there are also rollable tables in there as well to give you inspiration for writing a song, you know, to, to give you prompts for lines, etc., and the process of writing a song involves you suggesting line, a line or lines, and it also um, involves the band voting on if that line goes in. And if the line goes in, you get some uh, creativity points. And at the end of a session, if you've actually got um, a good song written, then the, the uh, band manager, who is basically the GM, can award you group creativity um, points as well. And these, these points can be used to modify roles. So you, you're getting rewarded for being creative. So... Did the idea for the game came first and then you looked around or you were considering what what system would be fitting for that and you went to Merc Borg or were you playing with Merc Borg and we're like, well, hang on, what if uh, I was doing uh, this or this type of setting instead? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I, 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 have, I have thought about that because often I sort of dive into games and I'm I'm really far into them before I've actually thought back about how what the origins or the inceptions of those games were. Um, People tend to think that it's to... it's really straightforward A and B and C, why actually it's more things happening in parallel and then it reaches a critical mass, yeah, I guess. It's... Yeah, well, I think any creative endeavor, I think, you know, whether you're, um, you know, whether you're a, a, a painter, an artist, whether you write songs or, you know, a, um, a writer, like a fiction, I think any creative endeavor generally comes from um i don't know a lot of ideas coming together you know a confluence of ideas and um then basically iterating over that, those ideas and sometimes it's just something in a moment i i i can't remember the exact moment that i decided to put merc borg with punk is dead but uh, punk is dead came first okay um i've been aware so i've been i i wanted to make a game about songwriting i wanted to make a creative game and it being that i'd done a lot of solo games i I think originally I planned it as a solo game and then I kind of lent into the I, I kind of enjoyed death metal aspects of um of Merc Borg I, I you know that game's been out three 
three or four years now, probably probably a lot more longer actually. But I've been aware of it throughout that time, and um, I I th- just one day when I just had that kind of eureka moment, thinking, well, come on, if this is a death metal game, then why can't we have a a punk game? And I started, I just started thinking about that more and more until eventually I came up, you know, on the idea of how that would fit in with being a punk and being in a band. And and what thematically what I could bring from being in a band to the Mark Borg setting. You mentioned Scooby Doo. Uh, Scooby Doo is, is a lot of investigation going on. Of course, you can do an OSR approach, which is the the players, you know, making most of the you know the the legwork to come up with uh, solving what's going on. Uh, is the game in terms of system still? Very close to Merc Borg, and you well, uh, not only but you you do a lot of uh, well murder hoboing to some extent, uh, except evil corporate mm-hmm. vampire, uh, or or do you have component of it which also uh, not not support because you don't need rules I think to support an experience necessarily, but that uh, rules that shape uh, other aspects like investigation. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So I mean. It's definitely a bit of a di- divergence from the OSR, um, you know, the the hardcore OSR that that Merc Borg is. It's um, I would say that what this game is 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 it's Merc Borg in spirit. Um, obviously, the the rules are heavily, you know, the foundation of the rules are are Merc Borg because one of the things I wanted you to be able to do was either bring anything from Merc Borg into my game, creatures, concepts, or take my my concepts like be a punk band in the Merc Borg world. This is so that that was something that was important to me. But I do want to do want to try and push away from the murder hobo aspect of it, you know, and get more into the change in society. So it is it is a game still filled with a lot of doom. It's in the spirit of Merc Borg. Um not only not only in the concepts behind the game, like you know, everything is going to end one day although I have got something else to say about that, um, but also in the stylization of the book. But again, I did want to dive... I, I don't think Merc Bog is a very accessible book. Um, I do want to make it more accessible, a bit more straightforward to read. So even though it will have a lot of the aesthetic, the design, the bright colors, um, it will also feel like its own game. It will just feel like, you know, a, a themed version of Merc Bog. It will actually feel like something that is unique and it is a standalone game, but it will have the spirit of Merc Borg in it. I like that, you know, creativity. You know, Merc Borg draws inspiration from OSR, but catch the ball and carry it on the other side of a mm-hmm. football field, I guess. I'm not good at sport. Uh, <laughs> and you take it <laughs> and, and, and turn it into yet something else. Uh, the setting is stuff. You, you, you mentioned a dysfunctional United Kingdom, which is present day you can only take it done despite all yeah, the all the that, love I have. That, that comment that comment has been leveled at me quite a lot, like so it's just real life then, but it, it it's got a bit more to it. Yeah, uh, what what's a bit more? I'm I'm very interested in the ununited kingdom. I believe that you got five districts. What's what's going on there? So if if you so this this I had to think long and hard about this because I didn't want to upset people. It's really easy to upset people in the UK, as as you probably know, um, especially when it comes to territory. Um, so what I tried to do is th- there's there's a reason why I split into into five realms because I wanted to create as as it's a game primarily about music that does involve um, a lot of you know aspects of other role playing games such as the, the three pillars. Um, what I also wanted to do was give um, players and, and the bandmasters and groups the ability to play in different kinds of settings. So the way I decided to do that was to create the five realms of the United Kingdom. Um, so you know, so we've got the we've we've got the the sort of southeast, which would be London, which is you know it's it can be very contemporary style setting. Just slightly above that, we've got the war, which is Birmingham, and that's a very industrial part of the UK, which. Is kind of steampunk, but industrial. You can you can play a more industrial type game in there. Above that, you've got where I'm originally from, which is uh, the Grim, um, which actually comes from um, a Sting, who's an, who are another amazing, which is its Grim up north, and that's kind of more of a Mad Max style setting with very disparate communities. Scotland, I've turned into the Fern Jungle, which is going to be a 
basically what it what it is if if you wanted it in D and D terms, probably chul, but um, with a lot more Scottish mythology that you know no D and D myth no D no D and D things in it, just just Scottish mythology. I'm trying to stay loyal to the regions and give them you know, give people something that they can identify. And then where I'm with now currently just Bristol that's and and Wales is the what they call the whimsy, which is a very dark equivalent of the Feywild, probably a little bit a, a little bit darker. And I know the Feywild can get quite dark, but it's quite a you know, there's a lot of nefarious spirits. And then over the sea, what what would be Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland is kind of my gift to GMs, which is basically status unknown. So that's a, an area that you can fill in the blank fill in the blanks on, you know. So I guess what I was trying to do with the realms is a identify parts of the UK broadly with broad strokes, but also b give GMs something where their players could say, well, why don't we go and play in this area next time because we could run this type of game or this genre. So do you have plans for splat books for each of the the different regions uh, in future project as a future project? Um, that's a good question. I, I only the the thing is I only really write what I guess I want to write, which isn't always you know it's it's not always the best thing to do when you're trying to run a business out of it. But um, I also think sometimes the passion shows through. I would I inevitably I will write um, expansions for this game, but I will put a um, pretty good um, a pretty good explanation of each each re each realm will be in the book anyway so it'll be kind of like Merc Borg in the sense of it will give you some openness but i'm also going to try and go into a little bit more depth about each region you know what you would find there what the sort of polit politics of that area are and also how it how it relates to the other realms but i'm going to try to do a lot of that within the book so Merc Borg and, and Cyborg uh, have quite a, a, a thriving community of people contributing with, with their own content. Is, is that something you, are, you have given a total? I mean, it's not like something uh, I think you can... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if creators had the, the power of just, you know, manufacturing that, <laughs> that would be quite something. But uh, yeah, is it something you consider that, uh, yeah, how you would support uh, yeah, third parties, uh, fans... Come up with own zines related to um, Punk is Dead. Yeah, we, well, we'll, it will be released um, using the same license that Merkborg uses. So any any developer can create their own content for it, um, make money off it if they wish, and um, yeah, it'll just have to, you know, it'll, it'll only really have to state that it's not one of our official products. But they can, you know, they can go ahead and and um, pretty much use it in the same way as they would um, create content for Merkborg. And uh, coming back to the the campaign itself, your your next goal is it's at fifty k. What what do you have in store for when you reach that stretch goal? Oh, that stretch goal. That's going to be a lot. We're, we're taking the um, we're taking the map, which was actually created by a brilliant artist called Jog Jog Brogzin. I think he is. He's an he's an artist hailing out of out of Ireland, uh, and we're gonna into like a big sort of um, fold out map that you can put on the table um, but we're also going to embellish it with sort of like a key of um, venues like so they're going to be we're going to go to the community and ask them for for kind of venues that they remember going to see bands in you know we want real sticky floor venues we don't we don't kind of want your or twos um, and you know I'm going to put some of my because I used to go to gigs when I was young so and we're going to make it that's kind of where your adventures start out they are kind of like the taverns where you where you learn about, you know, you're going to play a gig, but you also learn about localized issues and problems there. Um, so it might be that you get your, you know, your issue from, you you might actually get to a gig and find out about something, or you might specifically go play there because you have found out about something. So we're going to try and itemize, put a bit more granularity on the map rather than it just being in the book at the moment. It just shows you the five, the five regions, the five realms, sorry. That's that's actually a nice, you know, uh setup when you start an adventure that okay, you are you at this uh venue and uh something goes wrong, the gig is cancelled, or you just finished your performance and someone comes up to you and asks you something, or you get thrown a kind of beer 
at the face and then someone is nursing you and uh... oh, you yeah you might not actually get out of the gig before you start a fight you know <laughs> it's um it's that's the way the game could go do you have uh do you have uh, rules supporting the gig performance itself? I mean, is it part of the the character sheet, or is it related to the um, songs yeah, you make? Yeah, there up? are. So there, there, there are rollable tables for the uh, yeah. There's a tutorial table for the gig, but you can make a group role in your stage presence. So um, that depends on how the bandmaster wants to handle it. How how important he sees that aspect of the game, or they see that aspect of the aspect of the game. So after the map. Uh, we've got we're moving into a completely other musical genre, hip hop. So, uh, you grew up listening <laughs> to to hip hop, or that's when you hire uh, someone to join the team and contribute. I uh, so 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 yeah. There's two things about that. Yeah, I I did grow up listening to hip hop. I was a um, kind of I would say early '90s. I was a huge 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 hip hop fan hip hop fan um i still listen to hip hop now and i listen to some 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 quite obscure hip hop bands i mean one of my favorite hip hop bands is the goats who hail from philadelphia they are they are very political um and definitely not gangster rap so i i do tend to veer more towards the political side of rap i really enjoy it um you know i enjoy a lot of lyrics which probably speaks to my sensibilities as a storyteller and a writer but but rap ultimately, I think, like punk, is it's a form of music created from what you've got. You know, it's it's an accessible form of music. Um, you know, the, the 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 young people that were creating rap music are not much different from the people that were creating punk music, insofar as they used what they had available to them. Um, they didn't have any kind of necessarily any kind of formal training in what they did. They just got out there and did it. And um, yeah, I'll. I'll probably reach out to some people who can help me either with artwork or um, maybe even some of the writing from, you know, from, from that community uh, that, that might be a little bit more um, qualified than I am to write, to write them kind of things, or at least get some kind of sensitivity checking and make sure that, you know, I, I've, I've written everything with, with some authenticity. You mentioned the politics of hip hop and the politics of punk also. Uh, do you think, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned before we started that you were happy with the no fascist welcome uh, logo on my cover uh do you dwell in into political uh questions in the game itself team the uh i i do and it's a strange because i've i've never really expressed my political opinions as far as the bit as my business goes on so on social media so i do realize you know this might be for some people, it might be seen as as political because it is punk, um, and I know punk had very left wing and and some right wing sides. Um, I would definitely state now that this is um, this leans towards the left the left wing of punk. You know, there's no place for any right wing punk in this game. Um, but you know, I have had. I mean, I've <laughs> I've had a few comments <laughs> on 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 Facebook and things about the game. Um, I think my favorite comment, if I can use not not too bad language, but my favorite comment was somebody had put it's um, left wing bullshit. So I I did I did an advert for the game. Well, an advert I did like a TikTok post and Instagram post for the game, which actually took all the reviews of people who haven't read the book. Uh, and we sort of we tried to own them. So you know I understand what some people in in these times on social media might see it as being. Um, a game that's trying to be political, but it's a game that's trying to get people to be creative and also just give them a sense of agency, maybe in a world that does feel a bit hopeless. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a form of escapism. Yeah, the, I guess the notion of punk as, you know, f fighting back to, against a situation and also the idea of, as you mentioned, of you've got the skills and the, the resources you have, but you go out there and, and you, you're creative with that. And uh, no matter, you know, what people's going to think and so on, it's uh, you know, when you look, when you look at music yeah. nowadays, including things with the, I mean, not, not to be like, oh, uh, that's not real punk and so on, but uh, things tend to have a, a lot of skills and resources. And there, there doesn't feel mm -hmm. sometimes that there's this space left. I mean, especially with the you know the the accessibility of music, you can listen to any 
artist anywhere. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's it's a bit difficult if you're a local. Uh, I, I guess back in the days, uh, although it might have been much before I, I was old enough to to be into music, but you could have a local scene and be you know decent for the local scene. Why now you you it feels like you're always confronted with the international scene and also not only international but the scene from you know back <laughs> back in time. And uh, yeah, you people are not encouraged enough of yeah, go ahead, do your thing. It is what it is, and that's great. Which is something still exists in the in the TTRPG scene, which which is nice, I find. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, I I feel like this game has been one that I've it's it's one that I've really enjoyed writing because it does. It's again coming back to a, a face a, um, a Facebook post that someone put, and I do I do read them, but I've got a very healthy attitude towards them. Somebody had put that one hundred percent this game was not written by a punk, and it depends how you define punk because I didn't know punk was that elite really. But you know, effectively, I think of the game, I write the game, I pick up a pen and paper at the beginning, then I you know then I start laying it out. I do everything myself. I do. Apart from the artwork, I pretty much do the whole game from start to finish, even, you know, making sure it's off to the printers, even fulfilling the games. We do all that ourselves. And that's the indie TTRPG space. It's got a lot in common with punk. You know, I might not have a Mohican and a leather jacket on and, you know, a, a, a stud through my nose, but we're still doing something with what we've got, with what, you know, we're making things for other people. And we're also, I think another part of punk is in, in being in been inspiring to people and that's what all I want my games to do is to inspire people to think well you know I could do this or I could make a game like this or I could write something like this um and so if if anything's in the spirit of punk I think that is yeah great well, you mentioned for the uh hip hop you, you might get a bit of support uh, for the for the writing uh, but I see the very final stretch goal. Uh, you're back in your comfort zone. Uh, it's a solo gaming version of the game. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, I'm I'm back in um, I'm back in where it all began. Yeah, the the um, the solo game, which will be um, the the only thing I haven't decided on what to do with that yet is whether to use cards or whether to use um, for prompts a uh, tarot deck or. A standard deck of playing cards, but I've I've got a pretty good idea of how how the whole thing's going to work. So I like the concept because it's not just uh, you play uh, Punk is Dead solo. It's it's folk hero, and yeah, you got this idea of the yeah. the solo artist touring on their own. I don't remember what's this movie with um oh, what's his name uh Twin Brother movie. I should have checked before, but yeah, yeah, you know the. the the artist traveling around, uh, uh, hitchhiking rides, uh, and so on. So yeah. that's that's cool, and that's all other avenues of of inspirations for you. That, absolutely, yeah, and and also, I guess what I enjoy about that there's a couple of things I enjoy about solo is is one you know it, it, RPGs are great and they're a great way of bringing people together, but. You know, we don't always want to be with people as well. And it's nice just sometimes to get away and play on your own. Or, you know, there's there's times when your your session collapses. Um, and, you know, for, for, for one reason or other, someone can't make it. So it means that you don't have to, uh, you know, not, not play an RPG on that particular night. But uh, something I've definitely been exploring a lot lately as well, and it is going to, I'm going to try and make it come into play in this game and come into play in a future version, a multiplayer version of Be Like a Crow that I'm making, is the ability to, if you can't make a session, you can actually go off and play, do something on your own, like a side quest, maybe to retrieve, to retrieve an object for the group, etc. Um, and it's it's something I've I've really been toying with the idea of making for a long, long time, that we can bring solo and multiplayer together. So it, would that be... What you describe would it be solo? Or would that be one to one? I'm actually about to start my first campaign as the single player with a game master. Um, no, no, it would be so. So, for instance, just just to give you the example of what I'm going to do with Corvus, which is going to be later this year, um, a backer kit. It's based on Be Like a Crow, so it uses the same character sheet. Um, 
it uses slightly different mechanics, but the, the difficult part was balancing the mechanics between cards and dice. Um, but it means that you can play the game with dice in a multiplayer group. But if you if you were to say, um, right, next Wednesday I can't make the session, and the group says, well, that's fine, but actually we're going to go off and do this. But why don't you, if on maybe on Thursday night when you're free, you go off and see if you can, you know, retrieve this object that we need or do this little thing or go meet this person or whatever. And, you know, that's something you might be able to do with the GM as well. You know, you might, it depends on the complexity of what you've got to do. But ultimately, you can come back to the group and say, you know, I died. I've had to roll another <laughs> character. Or, yes, I got the object. Or, no, I didn't get the object, but I got Avenge lead on me. the object. And... <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, I, I love exploring these ideas. I love seeing where we can take role-playing games. Yeah, I like, for sure, I like campaign dynamics when, I mean, uh, sure, it's great when everybody's available all the time, but uh, by far, I prefer to play with, you know, not all the players, even a single one, uh, rather than not play at all. So, it, and it's, I think it's like a show or a book, it, you know, it changes the spotlight slightly between characters and it helps flesh mm -hmm. out the, the overall arching story. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's um, ag again, uh, my my dream for the the Corvus game, and maybe even maybe even this game with the solo mode, is that you could start playing this solo, and then bring the same character into a multiplayer game if you wanted, or or vice versa. If if the if a game collapsed, as you know, they they do occasionally, you could just continue playing solo. When I mean, uh, I still have to actually make live my first funding campaign uh, but I know sometimes uh, you know we have stretch goals but even the final stretch goal is the real stretch goal so we already worked towards it have you already worked towards the solo mode or is it something like oh that that would be nice if we reach that and mm. and you you keep it on the side and you will you will touch it properly uh, once the tr stretch goal is uh, attained I think it's somewhere between those two those two points. So obviously it's not laid out. There's no, you know, I haven't put until the, the part of reaching that stretch goal is to allow me to have the time to do it so I can eat. Um, but the, the by the same right, I have an idea of how the having having written three solo RPGs, I have an idea of how the mechanics are going to work and and how I want to play that through. So. The work would really be in just writing the prompts and creating the um, creating the layouts, which, um, I, to be honest with you, I'm having a lot of fun with. So I don't think it take any time to do the actual creating of the layouts. Uh, the prompts are always the the prompts are always the more difficult thing to do because you have to make sure that they make sense when they're combined together. Because if if you've seen Be Like a Crow, that's that uses dynamic prompts, so it's kind of a lot of my goes into play testing it what i would say about solo rpgs though is you can do at the outset you're not reliant on other people until you want to do the final polishing because you can do a lot of the play testing yourself mm -hmm, because yeah you know it's a it's a solo rpg so you can you can make sure before it even goes out to anybody that there's no glaring you know loopholes or or imbalances or things that you know just don't work that's interesting actually because yeah indeed you can play test on your own but uh what i found with i mean it's interesting also how you you don't realize that sometimes you project things you already know in the text which is not mm -hmm. quite there so do, do you i assume you still have a step when you hand the solo game for play test without your involvement yeah You're like oh, hands off i'm not i'm not around i'm not telling you anything just have a read Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, there's several there's several steps to that. So I mean, an, another place where we do pick pick things up before um, it even goes to other player testers is our proofreaders because you know it goes to proofreaders before it goes to player testers to make sure it makes sense. And we use proofreaders that are involved in the gaming industry. So I'd recommend anybody not just to hire. I've hired a regular proofreader before, as in just a proofreader that does proofreads anything and then i've also hired a proofreader that is involved in the gaming industry and obviously the latter one makes more sense because they can pick up on well things like you've named a rule this here you know and you haven't named it that there you've changed the name and that can happen you know you might you might think of a better name for a certain um skill or something um so they can also pick up they often do pick up things that don't seem to make sense in the rules 
So I, I'd, I'd always say to anybody, you know, that's writing a game, if you can get a play, a, a, a proofreader before you even send it out to your playtesters, you will get yourself 90% of the way there. Yeah, my, my own current project was with Abby. Uh, uh, it's currently with a rules editor. And I must say, not only mm -hmm. it, it, it brings so much in terms of, you know, bringing the text up a notch for someone who, I, I guess I write games, but I don't consider myself really a writer. Like, I could never do law or, or, or things like that. But not only it brings up the 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 text and the you know the, the how robust the rules are and un, how understandable and accessible they are. But it, even when I'm writing, it makes me it makes it easier to write because I worry less about getting things perfect. I need. I need to get my point across, and then I know uh, Chris S. Sims, uh, so I hire him for the second time as rules editor. But I'm like, I feel confident that I can go there, and, and Chris will sort it out to some extent. Yeah. Uh, afterwards, it's it's quite liberating to know that you got someone, uh, you know, uh, in your having your back uh, next. Yeah, I I agree with that, and you know, I'm I'm. I don't think I've, I'm even ashamed to admit anymore that when I send something off to the proofreader, it can come back with a few hundred um, changes, <laughs> which sounds, that might sound like a lot, to, a lot to some people, but it's generally maybe a bit of grammar or maybe just rewriting things or full stops or commas or all kinds of things. Because what I do do is I just, I just write and, and I think I'm good at doing what I'm good at doing to get it so far. And then, you know, someone else can, that is their job. Their job is to, because I think when you're inside the game as well, you don't always notice everything that's wrong with it, or especially not as far as grammar and, and things go, because it, you know it's something you're projecting straight out of your thoughts onto a sheet of paper or the screen. And you know, you, you're you reading it in a way that you understand. And, and again, that also comes in with, you, you touched on writing law there. That's one of the most, um, I guess writing law and mechanics, one of the most difficult things is knowing how much you need to put outside of your brain because it's like the tip of an iceberg. There's there's a lot of things you have, a knowledge you have about your own game that the, the reader does not need to know. But it's also making sure you don't leave too much out as well. So it is a really it's a really fine balance. And I think definitely a, a proofreader can, you know, pick up on things, things like that. And you know, it's possible to miss whole paragraphs that, that might be important out of the game because you feel like something self-explanatory and, and maybe it's not. It, the, you're entirely right with the fine balance because I also find there's an aspect of, I mean, I see that in my work, especially when we do, you know, those boring PowerPoints. I mean, a big part of the work is controlling the amount of information you bring to the table. So it's not just, mm -hmm. oh, I should also explain this and that. I think that at some point, there's the question of if, or oh, is it too much information? Actually, do I need to power it down so the essential comes across? And actually, it reminds me. Uh, I was watching the video you made for the launch of the campaign, and you mentioned that <laughs> um, Punk is dead uh, is you consider it to be more accessible than Merc Borg and Cyborg because you you include mm -hmm. more onboarding information regarding things and mm -hmm. I, that's something i actually found fascinating with uh i'm more cyborg than murkborg myself but how it it sort of set aside a personally i would say a slight form of a hubris to think that uh oh you can learn a role-playing game on mm. your own with a book uh no cyborg and murkborg consider mm -hmm. no you already know what's a role playing game you're familiar with it if you don't you you'll find people to explain to it you'll find resources online this is a system this mm -hmm. is the vibe go and and uh and uh yeah get things sorted uh on your own but at least you know the information is important and if you're a bad reader like i am actually too much mm -hmm. text is a barrier rather than a, a support uh that that was the approach which i'm not saying at all is the right approach but it was fascinating how how did you balance that yourself you you with you it seems like you went back me from a between point with traditional game in terms of, of the the amount of information what what did you add to i could murbog beyond the, you know what makes the spirit of uh, Punk well is for dead? a start <laughs> for a start the contents are at the front um so 
that's, that's one big addition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not the worst um, game for tables of content, Cyborg. I've seen much worse. No, I mean, if you're used to reading books from the back, then maybe, you know, Merc Borg is really well presented. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a good point because there, there are some decisions to be made when, when you write an RPG. Like when you, you know, for instance, when you're doing character creation and you're mentioning skills, is that a good point to mention skill checks and how they work, or do you do that later on for the GM? Or and it's you know that there are a lot of there yeah there there are a lot of considerations to to make. Um, I feel like though it's not for me. I get what Murbog's doing stylistically, and I feel like it's not for me because one of the things I want to do, and I, I did this with Be Like a Crow, and it's still a, a big selling point for Be Like a Crow. Um, is that I wanted to create something that introduce introduce people to role playing games. So I get a lot of people that buy it that say I've never played a role playing game. I don't really want to get to a table with a group or buy a massive, you know, three four hundred page manual. You've got an eighty page book here about fifteen pages, w which are rules. Um, I think it's really important just to at least have a page that explains what a role playing game is and that it and and that it's a conversation. And I think it is fine to say, you know, you go off and watch videos there are videos online and to give some examples um but then again i think it's also right to say that this isn't the only way to play a role-playing game but to also i think you have to put some expectations in and one of the first things i always put in any role-playing game book i i write is you know if you're familiar with role-playing games you can skip this section but i suggest you read it because you might learn something new great um is there anything you we missed in terms of for about uh, Punk is Dead that you'd like to cover? Um, not really. No, the only thing I would say about it is I've had so much fun writing it, and um, I really feel like that's going to shine. You know, I feel like it's going to shine through in the game. So, I guess one thing I would like definitely like to say about it because um, I don't know whether it holds it back is you do not need any musical talent to play this game. Um, it's it's not the point. It is a songwriting game. You can bring instruments to the table if you want. I have got um, a kind of unofficial rule in the book that says if you do play an instrument, you're not allowed to play that instrument in the game. <laughs> so if you actually can play an instrument, um, you have to play a different instrument. Um, you know, it it's ultimately it's a game. And, and going back to what we've just said, there are different ways to play a role-playing game. And... Um, you can take the songwriting aspect of it to as, as deep a level as you want, but what you need to do is just come to it with the punk spirit and, you know, have that feeling that you can, um, that you can change the world. So it's not as, I would say it's not as desolate as Merc Borg. It does, it, it does utilize the, um, the kind of like the doom clock aspect of it, mm -hmm. the Psalms. However, I think what's very different, and I did say I was going to mention this earlier on, what's very different about my game is that there is going to be the opportunity as a band you level up. You don't get better as individuals per se, other than if you find things, but as a band you level up from playing grubby clubs to, you know, bigger venues, stadiums, getting your word out there. Um, and this is a way that you can pull the doom clock back by creating hope. You, you mentioned the I really, I haven't asked, uh, uh, I mean, it's, very OSR-ish or, or, you know, typical uh, dungeon crawling, but uh, do you have, uh, uh, is your instrument your class or, or does that work? No, your role, so you don't have a class, well, what would be analogous to a class is your role in the band. Mm -hmm. So you you have a role, so you would be like a guitarist or you would be a, um, a drummer. Um, and you can you can tweak them a little bit, but, you know, just, just for obvious reasons, a drummer has got a, would be very good at tough and um, strength so they they're very kind of you know full on um <laughs> just just bashing things so they are kind of like tempo keeping barbarians but i i think that's reducing them a little bit a little bit too much but it gives you a a feel for you know what a role does actually give you is there a set, uh you know is, is there a chance that uh, as the drummer you will self combust in place or you're you're the first to disappear like in final tap <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Um, yeah, there's, um, I don't know, I mean, there's, look, there's, there's been a, a lot of famous drummers out there and a lot of strange things have happened to them, so there's a chance that Sadly, if you're a yeah. drummer, anything could happen. And you're, you're likely to be the, the thing that holds the band together, but also the wildest as well. 
so there's there's quite a paradox there great uh all right so uh, well well i will include a link uh to the the campaign i think punk is that is also very good easy to to Google, you can uh, RT, add RPG yeah. behind it, so people know where to find it. Uh, when is the campaign ending? Uh, for how long those people have uh, to support it? I think it ends at, um, now let me get this right, it ends on the 29th of February, because I just ran it from the 1st to the 29th, so that would end at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. UK time, which is about probably 7 a.m. PST, which is not a very good time, so it means you're going to have to get up early to back it on the last day if you're uh, in the States. Um, but yeah, I think, I'm not sure. I've seen Backer Kit seems to have this thing where if the train keeps going, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Oh. If, the tr if the Backer train keeps going, they keep the campaign running. Okay. Um, until 10 minutes. I was watching one the other day that was down to nine minutes, and I was just intrigued because it was, I think it was the first one I'd seen ending, and um I thought, I'll just watch it and see it end. And I, I kind of went off and did something, made a cup of tea or something, and came back, and it was still on nine minutes. And then I noticed <laughs> that when it got down to five minutes and someone backed it, the backer train went back up to nine minutes. So I don't know whether... That, I'm going to have to reach out to um, backer kit because I don't know whether that's something automatic or something that needs checking. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. The other side of that is that, that I don't really want it to go on too long because the day after we're flying out to um, Louisville to, to attend Gamma, so... I kind of want to know where we are before we go there. Uh, well, it's interesting because backers kids used for late pledges on other crowdfunding platforms. So you would imagine to some, yeah, yeah. To some extent, yeah, it keeps going. So let's say I'm this person who at Pacific time 6.30, I, I do my late pledge. Uh, you ship worldwide, right? Uh, despite the, you know, yeah. ongoing challenges of the still United Kingdom. Yep. Okay. Worldwide, we do, yeah. Europe, everywhere. Great. So, yeah, well, we also. It's probably important to note that we also pay um, landed costs for for the EU, which basically means that we pay all the VAT. So you you know you oh, okay. get the delivery to your door. Great. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. We've all done right. that ever since that little thing called Brexit. Ever. <laughs> Yeah, which, uh, um, <laughs> I will find a way around no, no that. No comment. Play, play, play the game, and you, you you'll get to if, if 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 Brexit wasn't your thing, you you'll probably get to. Just, just pledge. Don't people. worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll be at your door uh, in time. No problem. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. Where can people find you? Where the, you wish to be found? Um, so uh, they can find me on most social media at Cricket UK. Um, you can also go to criticalkit.co.uk and um, that's it really. I mean, you can just, you can either search for my name or you can search for Critical Kit. We'll, we'll come up somewhere. Brilliant, great. I think we had some uh, hiccups with the stream. We got interrupted at some time, uh, but the recording here, I think fingers seem to have that's worked fine. fine. So uh, I will put the video on YouTube for people who watch bits of it on Twitch or else I'll see this right now or people won't see the video and listen to the audio, audio so yeah links in the description for that thanks again Tim and uh, everyone rush to uh, to support uh, Punk is Dead yeah. thank you take care everyone bye bye